All right, good to see you all. Uh, we're continuing on in our series of spiritual disciplines. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, we covered the topic of everyone's spirit discipline, submission. Right, and not, the, not the easiest discipline, but uh, if there was a symbol that described submission in, in, the, in the life of Christ, it was the cross. You know, him laying down his life completely, him giving up his life, you know, for the sake of the world. The cross symbolized submission. And this week, our spiritual discipline is actually service. Serving each other, service. And if there was a symbol in the life of Christ that described service, it would probably be a washcloth or a towel. Or if you want to make it more modern for us today, it might look like uh, the, the, a toilet scrubber. You know, the, the, the thing that nobody wants to do, the thing that no one is, is, hope, is you hope to pass off to somebody else. Or it might look like, uh, like, like the dish scrubber after a meal. When everyone's, eat, and everyone's done eating and they all look at each other and who's going to be the one to pick up that dish scrubber and start washing all the dishes after this meal? You, know, you kind of want to back out and get out of it. You know, the towel becomes a symbol of service in the life of Christ. You know, when Jesus gathered his, his disciples together at the Last Supper, you know, they were doing something that they were really good at. They were arguing with each other. You know, the disciples were very petty. They liked to argue with each other. And they were arguing over who was the greatest among them. It's some evidence of this. I think it's uh, locked up there, correct? Hmm. Oh, there we go. This is Luke 9.46. And an argument arose among them as to which one of them was the greatest. I mean, these are our spiritual fathers here. And these are, these are the people that we look up to, the, you know, the founders of our faith here, the guys that were with Jesus himself. And what are they doing? Arguing over which one of them is the greatest. See, the problem with arguing over who the greatest is, is you can't decide which one of you is the least. Which one of you is the last? If you're arguing over who's the best, then who among you is the least? Because none of us, okay, I don't think most of us really care about being the absolute greatest. I mean, we all, I think we're okay with not being the best in the world at something or being the greatest, but none of us want to be the very worst. None of us want to be the, we're okay with not being the first pick, but we definitely don't want to be the last pick. You know, we don't have to get the best score, but as long as our score is not as bad as, you know, a little, little Billy over there who's got snot dripping down his nose and just can't, you know, hasn't studied in his entire life. If you have a Billy, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, none of us want to be the least. You know, and as they gathered for the Passover feast, the disciples knew that at this time that somebody was going to have to wash the feet. It was it was a custom, you know. They all, you know, there weren't you know paved roads like we have at that time. There's much more dirt. They wore sandals. There was dirt on their feet. It was caked. It was nasty. You can imagine a world without with the, the kind of lotions we have today. They probably had lots of cracks, and you can just imagine what these people's feet looked like. I mean, we had rugged men, and they knew that someone was going to have to wash the feet. So probably a lot like after dinner. Sitting around saying, who's going to wash the dishes? We're all just kind of looking at each other thinking like, oh, you know, I got, I got homework to do. I got to, I got to go in the back room. Got, oh, you know, something just came up. I got a floss. Whatever it is. We're trying to think of ways to get out of it. And so they're all kind of staring at each other thinking, not going to be me. But then guess what happens at this time? Jesus himself, you know, the son of God goes and he picks up a washcloth and he picks up a basin and he decides that I'm going to redefine what it means to be the greatest. I'm going to redefine what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. I'm going to flip upside down the world's view of what the least is and show you that in the kingdom of God, the least is the greatest. That's how you, be, you become great in God's kingdom. And he was the example to them of what service looked like. And then he went on to say this. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. So with this command in mind, I'm going to have the ushers now bring forward the basins and the washcloths. What's up on it? 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't make you wash your feet in the church. We have, we have actually done that in this church before, on stage. Might have made for some awkward times, but uh, I won't do that this morning. But he did that. Take the lowest position. You were able to look at the world system that tells us this is what greatness is, this is what status is, and this is what being important is. And we're able to say no. We're able to say, I don't have to live by that kind of standard of greatness. I don't have to go by the way you define status. I don't care if, you, if this job is below me in the world's standards. We're able to say no to the world. We're able to deny the, way that it, the, the, the kind of pecking order that the world creates. Now, pecking order is kind of a funny description, but you know, if you put chickens together in a pen, I've never actually raised chickens, but I read this. If you put them together in a pen, they have to establish a pecking order. So, you know, they, they, which one is the most dominant? They're going to kind of like peck at each other until they figure it out. They kind of immediately establish this system of dominance, this, this kind of this hierarchy in, in the pen. And we're very much the same. You know, you put a bunch of people together, you know, think of this in, in elementary school, right? You put a bunch of kids together, or a bunch of people, or adults, or in the workplace, and they immediately begin to establish their own form of, of a pecking order. And which one is the most dominant? Who's going to back off when somebody else speaks up? And who's going to sit at this seat? And who's going to you know, take this kind of status and that kind of status? You know, we establish this among ourselves. But being a servant is able just to, to, to completely reject that whole system, that whole pecking order that the world creates. You know, Jesus redefined what leadership looked like. He redefined what authority looked like. And he goes on to say this. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They use their power, their status, their authority. And their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever will be great, you, or among you, must be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve. You know, it's important to understand that service, even if we are serving, it can be done from a lot of different motives. It can be done an improper way, which is what we're going to call self-righteous service. And it can also be done the correct way in the kingdom, which we call true service this morning. Self-righteous service. Let's go on. We're going to kind of differentiate the two for a little bit. Self-righteous service is done by human effort. It's done by human will. It's, it's, it's our devising, our energy, our plans, our, our, our ten-step system of how we're going to serve. Not that it's bad to make plans, but the difference between that and true service is true service mainly comes from a relationship with God deep inside. That's really where it begins from. It doesn't come from, from, our, from our agenda. It, it, it comes primarily from a relationship with God. Now, if you want to make some steps to service after that, that's fine, but it, the heart of the matter is true service comes first from a relationship with God. And it serves out of God's promptings. It serves out of God's urgings within your own spirit. Self-righteous service is impressed by the big deal. The big deal. It's impressed by the bright lights, the huge project, the massive numbers. You know, wow, they had 10,000 people at their thing. That must be a big deal. You know, I can tell you of missionaries that I know of who have been in Muslim countries for 15, 20, even more years than that, and have never seen a single convert. Now, how are we to judge greatness? Is it, is it the crusade person who has 25,000 people that they, that they get a number for? Or is it the person who has been serving 20 years without any visible fruit? You know, God's not the one who's impressed by the results. God is not impressed by your results. You know what he's impressed by? Obedience. Yes. God could care less about your results because the results aren't up to you in the mind when it really comes down to it. But the, the obedience, doing what he asks you to do, surrendering to his will, is what he is really after. That is what impresses God, if we're obedient to his calling. So you know, self-righteous service looks at the big deal. True service is okay with doing the little things. You know, self-righteous service, it requires external rewards. 
It wants human applause. It wants recognition. It wants people saying, you did a great job. You were the one who did that. You know, awesome. True service is okay with doing it in secret. It's okay with being hidden in the way it serves. You know, because the reason for that, the main concern of true service is, is, is God. It's doing it in the eyes of God and, and seeking after His approval. So whether or not somebody sees you do it is not the main motive. If God sees you do it, the true service is okay with that. It's satisfied by it. Self-righteous service is concerned about results. And will the person that I'm serving reciprocate the, 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 the service I've given them? Will they give back in, in a loving kind of way? Or will they give back to me what I've given to them? <coughs> a true servant is just as fine with serving their enemies as it is with serving their friends. It's okay with not getting reciprocated the feelings that it puts into it. Because that's not the main reward in the first place. It's before God once again. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve. You know, are you only concerned about serving those who the world says have status or the world who says they're successful? Are you only concerned about serving people that will make you look good or that will make you look cool or, or whatever it is? Or a true servant doesn't get caught up in that. A true servant is okay with serving the least of these with serving the people that, that society esteems as being last, as having nothing to give them in return. You know, the outcast, the low, the broken, the drug addict. It's okay with serving those. A self-righteous service serves only when there is a feeling to serve. Now, I might step on some toes here, but oftentimes in the Christian circles, we call this being moved by the Spirit. Now hear me now. That's a, I just used the Dennis Goley saying. Come on now. Just tell me the truth. Be honest with you. Oftentimes we, we, we call this being moved by the Spirit when in actuality it's just our fleshly feeling saying, I don't want to do that. Or that's something that's going to make me feel really personally, individually rewarded. Now it's up to you to discern. It's up to you to, to use discernment in those things. But a lot of times we mistake God's promptings with our own selfish fleshly desires. A true servant knows that oftentimes our feelings are hindrances to true service. And instead of allowing our feelings to tell us how to serve, we should allow our serving to tell our feelings how to feel. We should let our, our service dictate our feelings and not our feelings to dictate what we serve. Just because you don't want to do it, just because there's not glory in it, and because it doesn't sound very fun to you, does not mean you should not do it. You can actually transform in doing those things that we don't have the initial desire to do. Self-righteous service fractures community. Why is that? Because self-righteous service focuses on the individual. It focuses on one person, builds them up more than the rest of the community. And it sets it out of context. And what does it also do? It says, you know, I did this for you, therefore you owe me something in return. And it creates this kind of guilt trip, and it, 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 it then is able to manipulate the people that are under it. A true servant builds up community. It contributes to it. It binds, it heals, it, it covers the wounds of those around it. But, you know, true service builds relationship and builds community as opposed to fractures it. <clears throat> you know, more than any other single way, if you want humility in your life, the best way to build it, the best way to receive it, is through service. And you know, we talk about each discipline kind of having their trademark thing that comes with it. But serving, its trademark is building humility inside of you. You know, humility is one of those things that we can never get more of by seeking after it. If, if, you're, if you keep saying, I just want humility, I just want it so bad, and you keep saying it, you know, it's probably gonna feel like it's further and further off. But if you really want humility, there is something you can do other than saying, I want it. You can go out and serve. You know, it helps humility grow in our lives more than any other discipline there is. 
when you set out in your life to do something for the good of others, to do something that is, a, is for the most part, a hidden work, not for the eyes of other people, not for your own benefit, but for someone else, before God alone, there's a deep change that starts to occur in your life. God's able to use those moments to mold and shape you and form you and to be so, a, a, a brand new person. He's able to give you humility. If you look at what the Apostle John writes, you know, he's describing all that's in the world. He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, if you really boil down each of these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you know, really those come down to being fixated by human achievement. To being fixated by what we can do in our natural abilities outside of depending on God. You know, thinking that we can do things in our own power and not need to depend on God. We're fixated by our own, our own wills, our own abilities, our own talents. Forgetting that we need God. You know, and this is what your flesh does. The flesh relies on itself. The flesh thinks it can do things on its own strength. And what's in direct opposition to humility? The flesh. The flesh is in direct opposition to being humble. Now, William Law, he was an influential Christian author in the 18th century. He said, if we want humility, then we should condescend to all the weaknesses and infirmities of your fellow creatures. Cover their frailties, love their excellencies, encourage their virtues, relieve their wants, rejoice in their prosperities, compassionate their distress, receive their friendship, overlook their unkindness, forgive their malice, be a servant of servants, and condescend to do the lowest offices to the lowest of mankind. Wow. Be a servant. Take the last place. Be the least among all of your brethren. You know, something happens when we begin to receive humility in our life. When God starts to work it into our fabric through serving. You begin to find more relation with the outcast in the world. You know, less and less you begin to identify with those in, in power, with those in prosperity. You begin to identify with the outcast, with the least. I mean, look at, look at people throughout history. I mean, look at a Mother Teresa. These were her, her family, the, the, the poor people on the streets of Calcutta were so closely identified to her because she had become so humble through her service, through her giving to these people <laughs> that she identified with them. And look at someone who's not humble at all. Do you think they can identify to the busters when they go into a restaurant, or to the people washing the toilets, or to the people on the streets. There's difficulty seeing themselves in those people. I mean, I'm not talking about just, just saying, you know, oh, that's really terrible. I'm talking about actually seeing yourself in those people's lives, in their eyes, in, the, in, in their condition. You identify with the outcast as we become more humble. Now, I think there's a natural kind of hesitancy that comes to us when we talk about this kind of service. When we talk about dying to ourselves and giving to others, I think there's a, there's a natural fear, and it's okay, that, that it, it comes over us. What if people take advantage of me? What if they start to walk all over me because I'm serving? I can relate to this fear. You know, it, it's the pride screams against it in ourselves. You know, I cannot let anyone take advantage of me. And it's a natural fear that does come up. But I think this is really where the line starts to get drawn in the sand. Where we talk about you know, choosing to serve or being a servant to all. Are you just doing acts of service or are you actually being a servant? And you, can, you, you want to use God's wisdom in, in these situations and use His leading. Although when you choose to be a servant voluntarily... We're laying down our rights to be in charge. Voluntarily laying down your rights to be in charge. You know that there is actually freedom when you do this. You know, if you voluntarily allow somebody to take advantage of you, then there's no way they can take advantage of you. You chose to give up that right. You purposely laid it down. So if you're
voluntarily giving up, you're free because nobody can then take advantage of your rights at that point because you've given them up willfully. You know, Paul talks in his ministry about voluntarily being a slave to Christ. I'm not talking about unwill, un, unwillful slaving. Now, that's, that's a terrible, humongous injustice. But there's a difference between what, what Paul talks about, voluntarily becoming a slave, choosing to give up his rights to Christ. And Paul did this. He became a slave to Christ. He gave up his rights. And I think we're being called to do the same thing in our lives. To voluntarily you know, give up our rights to Christ. You know, you're no good in the ministry until you do that. I'm slowly learning this. You know, if you don't lay down your rights, you're no good in the ministry. If you have success, I've been thinking about this, that's probably the worst thing that can happen to you if you have not yet given up your own rights to Christ. And if you have success, guess what? That's probably the first thing before a, a fall. You don't want success until you've given up your rights to Christ. Otherwise, pride will set in. But God wants to start with us surrendering, with us giving up our rights, giving up you know, our talents, giving up our, our, our thoughts, our ideas, our choices to Him. You know, complete, I'm not talking about just a little thing here and there. I'm talking about complete, total surrender. Complete and total abandonment to His will. There's no other way to do it. There's really not. You know, Paul didn't talk about just you know, voluntarily doing a few acts. He talked about voluntarily becoming a slave. Permanent service to Christ. A slave no longer has rights when they've given them up. And that's the image he gives to us. And it's on purpose to paint how strong and how powerful that really was. Voluntarily giving up everything to Christ. Surrendering our wills to Him. And so what are some of the ways that we can practice service in our daily lives? You know, it... it you know, I'm going to go over just a few things, and they're not the normal things we think of, but they're more like attributes or, or, or certain ways that we can practice service in our daily life as we encounter people. First one is hiddenness. You know, if we do all of our serving before other people, we're probably pretty shallow people. We probably haven't developed a lot of depth in our humility or a lot of depth in our character if we're doing it before other people. You know, it's really difficult to do something without recognition. It's really tough. You know, often we feel like nobody else is receiving benefit for what we're putting in. You know, but that's not true. But you know that, that hidden acts of service kind of permeate a culture. You know, people feel that there's more love and compassion around them, even if they don't know exactly what, you know, what it is that you've done. You know, in this church, we have people. I mean, there's a reason that there's, there's, there's a feeling of love and compassion when we walk into this building. Because we have people behind the scenes who are giving themselves up that don't care about recognition. We have people voluntarily serving, and it's contributing to everyone here. And we have people, like, like when we were renovating the room, you know, I would come in here at you know, 10 o'clock at night, and Drake would be in here painting. Like, what are you doing here? Oh, just pulling the beat down here, working. You know, didn't even tell me. And tell anyone just just serving the people like like you know Carrie for 20 years doing the communion. Most people probably don't know about that. You know, we had, you know like my dad would come down here and put up the signs outside and you know try to bring coffee and donuts. Not getting the praise. You know, we're we're all benefiting from these things. We're all feeling their effects without really knowing what goes into it. You know, a, a hidden act can add. To, fe to, to people feeling God's love and compassion in their lives. It's not going unnoticed. There's a service of small things. You know, a lot of us only want to do what we call the, the big stuff. You know, we want the, the massive crusade, or we want the, the humongous event, or the, 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 humo the really big laying down sacrifice kind of thing in our lives. But you know, the small things are really what keeps everything going. I think mothers understand this a lot. 
The small things, those daily things you have to keep doing over and over again without the recognition, without the fanfare, without people saying, wow, look at that, that thing you did. I, I think mothers instinctively know this because they have to do it so often. Small things are what keep everything running. There's a service of the small things. You know, in the realm of the spirit, you begin to notice that it's not the big things that are really the big things. It's really the small things that are big in the kingdom. It's those everyday things that are really significant in our lives. And us kind of focusing on the big things often blinds us to doing that. We become accustomed to the, to, to the, to the light shows or the, the numbers or, or, or the applause. But there's a service in doing the small things. Another, you can guard the reputation of other people. You know, who here has a person they know in their life they can go to, and no matter what, they're going to guard their reputation. You can tell them the worst thing about yourself, and you know you're going to be safe with them because they're going to protect you. They're not going to go take that thing you tell them and use it against you. They're not going to go tell it to someone else who's going to use it against you. They're going to guard it. You know, guarding other people is a way of serving other people. How important that is. How destructive gossip is. How destructive it is if we talk negatively about people in our church. How that comes and it, and it does the opposite of building. It destroys community. It breaks us apart. It fractures us. How good it is to have people in this body that if somebody comes to them with the word of gossip... They, they let them know, I have no interest in hearing this. I'm not going to carry this on. I don't want to hear it. If you have something to say, tell that person. You can serve each other by guarding each other's reputation. It's one way we can lay ourselves down for each person in this building. Next part. <laughs> we can serve by allowing ourselves to be served. You're probably all raising your hands. I'm really good at this one. <laughs> You know, being served is also a form of service. You know, when Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet, what did Peter do? No, 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 he refused to let him wash his feet. And, and it, it might have come across like that was being humble, but in actuality, that was pride as well. It was veiled pride. A lot of us have veiled pride, not receiving when somebody serves us. Because, you know, to be served is an act of submitting to their authority in lots of ways. So in many ways, we have to allow ourselves to be served so that we can submit to other people as well. Another thing, common courtesy. You might say, what are you talking about? You know, common courtesy is a good way of serving each other in our body. It's serving each other in this group. Did you know that when somebody walks by, acknowledging their existence and saying hi to them is not being shallow. That, if you, that you don't have to respond by saying, how are you, with, my day is terrible. You know, that we all understand in our, in our culture that asking somebody, how are you, is, is a way of acknowledging their existence. It's a way of saying, I see you, I recognize you, I value you enough to, to say, you know, to say you know, hi to you, and how are you. But I don't necessarily need you to come back at me with every part of your life. You can if you want, that, that's, that's fine. But we all understand the purpose behind that is to acknowledge each other. That's a way we can serve each other. You know, saying thank you, saying please, and opening a door. I mean, common courtesy is a way of serving each other. It's important. It goes a long ways in letting people know that they're valued. Now, I've heard it, I, I've heard it said that a lot of times, people that were going to commit suicide change their mind because somebody would just acknowledge them. You know, just being acknowledged can actually save somebody's life. You know, people often feel like they're alone in this world and just want somebody to acknowledge that they exist, that they have some type of value. Another, hospitality. You know, it's become less and less common, I think, to have people stay at your homes. You know, it's something that I always saw my grandparents doing. Their, their home, you know, for many years is like a hotel. And people staying in it all the time, thinking, you guys are busy. Get, you know, stop bringing people over. You're wearing yourselves down. It was just one of their, it was just one of their calling. I mean, one of the things that they love to do is be hospitable. People would stay in their homes, and they would travel from sometimes across the world 
or across, you know, all the way from Canada or from across the, across America and stay in their home is being hospitable was a way they could serve other people. Maybe God's telling you I should open up my home once in a while and allow people to be served by me. And that doesn't mean you have to wait on them hand and foot many times. It just means, you know, just making yourself available to them, being hospitable. Another one, listening. You know, listening to others is a way of serving them. You know, giving your ear to them, giving your time, giving your attention, stopping your day, stopping your plans, and being a good listener is a way to value other people. It's a way to, to acknowledge that they're, that they're important, to acknowledge that you care about them, to say that you love them. Listening. You don't, you don't have to know all the answers to be a good listener. Actually, a lot of times, having answers can be a really big hindrance to listening well. A lot of times people aren't looking for that answer. I, mean, I think guys struggle with this the most. I mean, guys like to solve the problems. We like to have the answer. We like to fix it right away. But listening, just for the sake of listening to that person, is a way of loving and serving them. Another is bearing the, bur the burdens of other people. You know, there's, there's a service of bearing each other's burdens. And, you know, that, that, that's not just you know, giving them advice. That's coming to them, sharing in their actual hurts. You know, sharing with them in their sufferings. If they're crying, probably the best thing to do with them is to not tell them a, a nice platitude. But the best thing is probably just to cry with them if you can. That's probably the most healing, most beneficial thing you can give them in the time of suffering. Is not to tell them it's going, you know, not, not to tell them a trite phrase, but to just suffer with them. And we have people in this church. We have George who visits people in the hospitals. And there's a ministry of sharing the burdens of other people in times of pain, in times of suffering, in times of sorrow. It's saying that their hurts matter. It's that I want to share and be in that with you and show empathy. And lastly, there's the service of sharing words of life with people. Building each other up. And not tearing down, not... Not laying burdens on them, but using your words, using you know, what God has said to you in order to speak life into other people. You know that when we spend time with God, if you spend a quiet time with God or read the scripture, to not just go there for yourself. You know, sometimes go to God and ask Him, God, I want something so I can speak life into somebody else. You know, approach the Bible that way sometimes. Approach prayer that way sometimes. God. Help me to speak life into someone and allow him to give you a word, not just for yourself. A lot of times allow him to give you a word so that it's for other people. Did you know that we really need other people to hear God's total counsel for our lives? That we're really imperfect at hearing God. And, and the other people are imperfect at hearing God too. That's why it, it, things start to get really messy when we start listening to other people's words for us. You know, the scripture says that out of the same mouth comes blessing and a cursing. We often add our own words to what we say to people, but instead of you know, getting rid of all people's advice or getting rid of all people speaking into your lives, that should cause us to run to God even deeper. Say, God, I need your help discerning all these things. I need your help hearing what you're saying through all these words. But listening to what other people say to you is so important. It's a way of valuing them. You know, we should never look down on anyone that would have a word for you. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter how long they've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how, you know, where they're at in life. We should value each word that is spoken to us. You know, value the least of these. You know, out of the mouth of babes, sometimes the most unlikely person will have the most profound word for your life. And it's directly from God. You might think, God, you can't use that person to speak to me. There's no possible way. And that's completely missing God's counsel in your life. Don't cross anyone off from speaking into your life, no matter where they are, no matter who they are. Allow God to use them as well. You know, I think this morning, in life in general, Jesus is calling you to pick up your towel or to pick up your dish scrubber and to serve the way that he served others. And to love and to be humble 
in the ways that he was in his life. You were called to serve as he served. And so I have a challenge for us this week. If you have a pen and paper, uh, please write this down. Or I'll post it on Facebook. But each morning, I'm going to challenge you. And before you leave your house, before you go about your day, pray this short one-sentence prayer and mean it. And really mean it before God. And that prayer is this. Lord Jesus, as it would please you, you know, once again, not for us, as it would please you, bring me someone today whom I can serve. And then trust and believe that he's going to put people in your life that he put there that are opportunities for you to serve him, to serve God. Trust and believe that he's going to bring those opportunities into your life for you to, to, to be a servant. So that's my challenge for you. you uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and just, and just bow your heads right now. We'll just pray that real quick. I'll we'll just say it under your own breath. Lord Jesus, as it would please you, bring me someone today whom I can serve.